Our God, you are so, so wise. You are so good. The way that you have chosen to reveal yourself in a general way through creation, that's one book of Revelation, and then in a special way through this second book of Revelation, that which is written down for us, that you may speak to us through it. Oh, give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. We are church. We are yours and you are ours. And you've assembled us together that you may address us, that you, Holy Spirit, would minister to our hearts. And I pray that you will find a heart full of worship, a heart prepared to be ministered to, and that the work that you do in this hour, Lord, would bear fruit. There'd be rich fruit from this. And in the latter part of our time together, we are going to break the bread, Father, and we're going to share the cup, and we're going to do that in remembrance of your Son, who is the beloved one, the one whom we love. And we'll be thinking about those thoughts at that time, but even now, we need to hear him speak through the passage we're going to be reading and considering this time. We pray for all these things because we want Jesus to be high and lifted up. Amen. Amen. You'll need your Bibles and you'll need them opened on Revelation chapter 1. It's a little bit of a leading introduction. First, before we come to consider those words in verses 9 to 20, I just want to remind us or inform us uh, that God will be glorified in Christ's church. That God is being glorified in Christ's church. And I want those words to be ringing through your minds throughout this message and throughout the course of this day. We began this series uh, just a, a little while ago. And in the first message, we begun with the words that are there, <laughs> how it begins, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's how this book even got its name that we attribute to it, a revelation uh, from apocalypsis, uh, meaning that which is revealed. It's kind of strange how many people think this book is more mysterious than it is. It's a book to remove the mystery and to give revelation, to give clear understanding as to the plans and purposes of Almighty God. And I trust as we travel through this series, uh, you'll realise that it's clearer than maybe others might have thought it to have been. Again, it's, it's the unveiling of mystery. That's what this book is. In origin, it's from God. It's God's revelation. Uh, we thought of this last time. Uh, the content of it is the testimony of Jesus Christ, the testimony that God gave to Jesus. So that's, that's the content. And it was given to John through angelic mediation. There are angels referenced 77 times uh, in this book of Revelation. And there's one or two primary angels, uh, messengers, that lead John through the Revelation uh, but the angels are, are many, actually. And even the Lord Jesus is at least one of those angels uh, we'll see as we travel through the book. But you have to remember that angels were messengers. They were to uh, give a message from God to his people. There were also uh, spirits sent to minister to those who were to inherit salvation. Um, but in this book... We also have to remember it is a book of prophecy. And that's really the style. And prophecy can mean simply to tell forth the words of God, the words that are for here and now. And prophecy can also be a foretelling of yet unknown things or yet unseen things. Um, so it can be twofold, but certainly every prophet. Uh, didn't invent the prophecies themselves. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit. These were prophecies that were given by God to his chosen prophets. But again, we have to keep in mind that God is glorified in Christ's church. God desires to be glorified in Christ's church. 
And the more we realize that and understand that, the more it will be the case. And God it enjoys to reveal himself to us. He enjoys to presence himself with us. Now, we, we have a record of some of the prayers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Arguably, the Psalms are the prayers of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's another series for another day. Although you can find it online on our website. Um, 150 uh, meditations on the Psalms. So I'd encourage you to visit there. But one of the most well-known prayers of the Lord Jesus we find in John chapter 17. In the night of his betrayal, he's with his disciples and he prays to the Father out loud. It's an amazing prayer. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote three volumes on that prayer. And again, I'd encourage you to read those three volumes. They're really, really helpful. Uh, but there's part of that prayer which, it, when we read, it's, it's a little bit hard to really know what is Jesus saying. It seems, seems to be some repetitiveness there, but it's not. What he's doing is he's praying to the Father with a heart cry that his people be one. They'll be unified, that God's love would flow through him to them, and their love would throw, flow through him to God and that the glory uh, would be theirs to enjoy. The glory that Jesus enjoyed uh, before he ever was incarnated, the glory he still enjoyed even on earth uh, in that uh, state of humiliation and humility in flesh, in human body, fully God, yet also fully man, um, and with the Holy Spirit anointing upon him, uh, and that glory he desires for us to enjoy also. And all that is wrapped up in these few verses that I'm going to read, which is very much the heart cry of Jesus that we see being actualized in the first chapter of Revelation. So you'll see a connection as we go. So Jesus prays that my prayer is not for them alone, the ones who are physically present at the time. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that's you, <laughs> that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Just that alone is mind-blowing. The love the Father has for the Son is equal to the love he has for you. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. That's enjoying the glory of God. To see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world doesn't know you, I know you. And they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. So that's the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ concerning you. That is his great desire. He would soon be leaving the earth. He would be crucified, buried, resurrected and ascend to glory where he would send the Spirit and continue to reveal the Father and continue to reveal that love and that glory to his people. And that's what he's doing even today. And yet that path to glory that we are on, brethren, is a path of suffering. It's a difficult path. And no one could walk that path alone. It's a, a path of testing, and it's a path of trials also. But then after that, glory. <laughs> uh, 
this book of Revelation, as summarized last time, can be summarized in two words. Jesus wins. There we are. Do you understand that? You've understood the book of Revelation. The mystery is really resolved in those two words. It's about Jesus who's one. And therefore he is our hope of glory. Because as sure as Jesus suffered and died and was resurrected and glorified, so we Christians shall suffer and we shall die. But we shall be resurrected and we shall be glorified. Forever men and women, not deified, but we will be glorified. And that is the great hope that is ours. And the great hope that the early church in that first century needed to be reminded of as the persecution was picking up pace. And many had already suffered much. They needed to be reminded that God has it all in control. Satan isn't holding the reins. He knows his time is short. He's full of fury. Revelation 12, 12 tells us that. The church, we need to be encouraged. We need to persevere. And we shall be glorified one day. So the first verse in Revelation, chapter 1, verse 9, is this. I, John... Your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. I was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, in chapter 1 verse 6, we're told that we are a kingdom and priests. And the idea is that we are a kingdom and we are to serve in this kingdom as priests. Here, John says in verse 9, that he is in the suffering and kingdom. With being part of that kingdom work in the kingdom uh, involves service, but it involves suffering also. John knew very well something of that suffering. When we get to chapter 5, we're going to expand all the more understanding of what's meant by kingdom. And you'll have to wait, come back for that later on. But again, that the backdrop of this book of Revelation was of much suffering. The Lord's people had always suffered. You go back as far as Abel, if you want to go way back to the suffering of the Lord's people. And through every generation, the Lord's people have suffered much, uh, right up to our present day. But the Lord Jesus did warn about that, didn't he? He said, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, and that is why the world hates you. They will treat you this way because of my name. The more the devil in them sees Jesus in you, the more the attacks will come. Now, John was the last living apostle. Um, by this stage, the others had, had all gone. A Judas Iscariot, he had killed himself, we're told that, Matthew 27. He was replaced by Matthias in Acts 1, but church history tells us that he was crucified. James the Greater, that's John's brother, they were the fishermen, and well, he was pierced with a sword until dead. And then James the Lesser, the other James, he was stoned to death. Peter, crucified upside down in Rome. Judas, also known as Thaddeus, he was beaten to death with clubs and hacked to pieces with an axe. Philip was crucified by soldiers. Thomas killed by spears. Simon the Zealot stabbed with a sword until dead. Bartholomew was crucified. Andrew nailed to an X-shaped cross. And then Matthew, who wrote the Gospel of Matthew, he was crucified. Paul was beheaded in Rome. 
Only John died of natural causes. But what pain he must have suffered to see his friends die one by one as they were faithfully going with the gospel message. He suffered many years in prison and he understood very well what it meant to suffer, to be in the suffering and, and the kingdom for the Lord Jesus' sake. Now in Hebrews, that's one of the books which mentions much of suffering, and many of the books of the New Testament do. Uh, they're written in such a way to encourage you know, the church as we, we go through these tough times, together and on our own also. And in chapter 11, there's the list of the faithful, those who suffered and, and lived for Christ and then died and went to be with him. And at the latter part of that chapter, they were those who were named and then there's others who are unnamed. Others, they were tortured. Uh, they refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. And they went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. And they wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. And these were all commended for their faith. And again, this was written to the Hebrew Christians primarily, but to everybody also, uh, what to do, you know, in the face of such suffering. They would have known people that died these ways and lived these ways. And, and so Hebrews chapter 12, 12, Hebrews chapter 12 begins with these words, Therefore, what should we do? Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And that's very much what John did. John, the apostle, would keep his eyes fixed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And God blessed him with this amazing revelation, vision, that we'll be traveling through with him and seeking to understand it and apply it to ourselves. He kept his eyes on Jesus. And that will help us now lead into the next verses that we'll be considering this morning. Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 to 18. This is what he saw. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. His hair, his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. 
and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And then he placed his right hand on me and he said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death. And Hades. So what did he see? He saw the risen, glorious Lord Jesus. In all his majesty. And he was really quite overwhelmed. It's a frightening scene that he saw. He lost consciousness. How have you ever been so scared that you fainted? Not from pain, but from fear. He collapses onto the floor. And he needs to be supernaturally touched, to be given strength, to rise up, so that he can see and write of that which would be revealed to him. So he was on, it was, it was on the Lord's Day. The only place that appears that phrase in its fullness in the Bible, uh, and there it was, the day that the church around the world, wherever it was at that time, would gather on the Sunday, right from the earliest records, we have proofs of that, and the church would gather, God would gather his people on the Sunday to remember the Lord Jesus Christ and his victory, his resurrection. That's why it became known as the Lord's Day, uh, the day when he rose from the dead. And so there was John on his own, it would seem. He knew of the seven churches he was responsible for, that he loved. He would love to have been with them, teaching them, helping them, blessing them. But it was in this prison colony, island, uh, separated from them, knowing that they would be gathering, still he wanted to mark that day as a day of worship. And there he was on the Lord's Day, and he was in the Spirit. Even what that means is difficult to explain. He would see things, but not with his eyes. He would hear things, but not with his ears. He would experience things, but not with his physical body. He was in the spirit as he received this great revelation. Now, William Hendrickson is a wonderful guy. I'm looking forward to meeting him in glory. Another lovely German. And this is a book he wrote, and this is what he wrote in respect to those verses. So I'm just going to read a little for us here. Let us try to see it thus. Notice that the Son of Man is here pictured as clothed with power and majesty and with awe and terror. That long royal robe, which is similar to what the high priest would wear, and that golden belt buckled at his breast, and that was very much what champions would wear. Uh, and that hair, so glistening white, uh, that was like snow. And, and even the whiteness of the hair is in reference to the divinity and the wisdom of God. And his hair then was white as snow, and on which the sun is shining, and it hurts the eyes. And then there were those flashing eyes of fire, eyes that read every heart, and penetrate every hidden corner, those feet glowing in order to trample down the wicked. And the bronze feet is really to help us to think of judgment. And then there's that loud, reverberating voice, and it's described as a trumpet, isn't it, in our passage? And God would often have a trumpet sound before a message would be given to the community of Israel, 
And we're told there's going to be a trumpet sounding before the Lord will return. And so this trumpet sounds and the voice as a trumpet to attract the attention of John of some very important things he's soon to hear. And he says this reverberating voice is like the mighty breakers booming against the rocky shore at Patmos. That sharp, long, heavy, great sword with two biting edges. And then that entire appearance as the sun shines in its power, too intense for human eyes to stare at. The entire picture, picture taken as a whole is symbolic of Christ the Holy One, coming to purge his churches and to punish those who are persecuting his elect. So that's helpful to help us understand something of what John was seeing. The whole vision is designed to excite to energize, to enthuse those who dare even to see what John saw, but by faith and by reading God's words. These are words to encourage. And yet, John found them quite terrifying. But it's interesting what John saw, because 600 years earlier, more or less, Daniel saw the same thing with very similar descriptions. Da Daniel saw the pre-carnate Christ. It was a Christophany. John is seeing the post-carnate Christ in his glorified body. But I'll just take us to see what, what, what Daniel saw and see if you can see some crossovers with some descriptions here. Daniel says, I looked up. And there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Upas or Ufas around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision, though uh, those who were with me didn't see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale and I was helpless. And then I heard him speaking. And as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. He passed out too. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And then he continued, do not be afraid. That's what Daniel saw. And in our text in Revelation chapter 1 verse 17, the Lord Jesus Christ extends his hand, touches John, and he tells him, do not be afraid. And he says, I am the first and the last. The next time someone says to you, nowhere in the Bible does Jesus claim to be God. Take them to first Chapter of Revelation, verse 17, and show them this title Jesus attributes to himself. I am the first and the last. And then take them to Isaiah, chapter 44, verse 6, where God says, Yahweh there says, I am the first and the last, and there is no God beside me. And in those chapters, you've got what they call the contest of the gods. God calling forth the false gods in kind of a competition to see who is truly God. And of course, he is the only true God. So he says uh, of himself there, I'm the first and the last. Jesus says here, I am the first and the last. And then he says, I am the living one. 
I was dead. Now look, I'm alive, forever and ever. And there he's referring to his humanity. He was the one who was conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit. He was the one who was born in Bethlehem. He was the one who was taken to Egypt by his mother and, and stepfather and then called out from Egypt and he went to Nazareth and he was raised there and then he began his ministry at age 30 thereabouts. This is the one who then preached, who then, by the power of the Holy Spirit, performed miraculous signs. He is the one they took and crucified. And when dead, buried him. But he's the same one who three days afterwards rose from the dead, alive. Never to die again. Now with a glorified human body. Fully God, fully man. He then, 40 days later, ascended on high for his coronation to be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And from that day to this, he's been reigning with all authority in heaven and on earth. This is the one who's speaking with John. And this description is so mesmerizing. And it's interesting to think that Daniel had another vision where he saw the Ancient of Days. And that is God, and there's a description there of him. And he sees one like a son of man. It's in chapter 7. And John sees those two descriptions combined in this chapter. You can visit it for yourself in Daniel 7, 9 to 14. And you can see the description of the Ancient of Days and of the Son of Man together describing Jesus in his glorified state. And what's more, Jesus says, I hold the keys of death and Hades. You don't need to fear death. We know him who has the keys. We know him who conquered death. People live all their lives in fear of death. But when you become a Christian, you need not fear death. It's the open doorway that leads us into the presence of our Lord Jesus. It's not to be feared. It's to be longed for, to be anticipated for, to be prepared for. It's going to be wonderful when we... Had arrived in a church in Cornwall, which ultimately became our sending church to Brazil and back and Madeira, a wonderful little church. We got there just in the last few weeks of a dear saint's life, uh, and she, she died. We'd only been going a few weeks to that church, uh, the lady who had become my wife, and so I remember feeling sad I didn't get to know this lady better. Everyone spoke so well of her. What a, what a wonderful Christian. You didn't mess with her, <laughs> this lady. But, you know, if you love Christ and she loved Christ, you're okay. Um, but I remember speaking to Andrea's and saying, it's, it's really sad. And then Andrea said, ah, oh, but she's had her glory day. And she had. She had entered into glory. What a wonderful experience was hers and shall be ours one day soon. Now, there are so many cultures and practices around the world, ancient and even up to the present day, where people lay coins on the eyes of their deceased loved ones or put a coin in the mouth. The idea is it's to pay for the passage into the next life. And yet you dig up those bodies. The coins are still there unless they've been stolen by somebody. But we know the one who has paid the passage for us to be guaranteed entrance into glory. Jesus has paid with his own shed blood. He's purchased that for us. There's nothing we can pay towards that. He's done it all. 
and it's sure and it's guaranteed. We know he's coming back one day and the sooner the better. But where is he right now? Where is Jesus? Where is the glorified Son of God? Well, as to his human nature and his glorified human body, he's in the highest heaven and he's reigning over the heavens and the earth from that place. But he's also with us by his spirit. The spirit of Christ is with us. And John saw him in verses 12 and 13 and also 16. He, he saw seven golden lampstands and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. And verse 16, in his right hand he held seven stars. Now what does that mean? Well, we're told in verse 19 and 20. John is told, write therefore what you have seen, what is now, what will take place later, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now the number seven uh, throughout the book of Revelation and many other places in the Bible also speaks of completion, speaks of perfection uh, and speaks of, um, sort of provision and authority and, and so there are seven lampstands. John would be commanded, ordered to write to seven specific literal churches that were there in his day that he was responsible for. And those letters to them would be for all churches of all ages. And so the seven is really to help us to think as much as anything of the complete church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus is among his church. And there are seven stars, angels, in his hands. They're the ministers that Christ himself appoints for his church. They're the pastors. They're the Bible teachers. Those through whom Christ himself is going to minister the word of the Lord to his people. These are those that are known to Christ. He's handpicked them. He's chosen them. He's equipped them. And he's anointed them with his grace, provided everything they need and empowered them that they would rightly divide the word of the Lord and feed the sheep the flock of Christ. And Ephesians chapter 4, you can look at that later, verses 7 to 16, that confirms all that I've just said. So these angels that are messengers, that are pastors, are appointed by Christ. Let no one dare to appoint themselves. It must be by divine appointment or you will enter into a whole lot of suffering and a more severe judgment. Christ must be the one who appoints his pastors for his church. And then he also empowers them to do the job that the, the flock of Christ might serve all the more fruitfully and joyfully enjoying one another and enjoying the very presence of the Lord Jesus as he presences himself among us. But how more specifically does this work? Does Christ feed his sheep through his under-shepherds? Well, we have that, verse 16, 
out of his, out of his mouth comes this double-edged sword. Now the Romans, they were very clever and they created a, a metal that was of superior strength to that which had been known formerly. Formerly, uh, a sword would only be sharpened on one side. But after the Romans developed this process uh, that they designed, now the swords were stronger and could be sharpened on both sides. And this is really what made the Roman soldiers so deadly. I instead of the soldiers just hacking with their sword, now they can be slicing both ways with their sword and do double the damage in half the time. It's a sword like that in shape, but a broad sword that's sharpened on both sides. A great sword that's coming out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus. And that represents the word of the Lord. The Bible, God's revelation. And as the word of God is rightly divided and correctly applied to God's people, it, it, cuts, it cuts away the worldliness. It exposes the error and the evil and the sin that must be dealt with. But then also this sword penetrates deeply and it opens up a channel into your very soul for the grace of God to flow in that you might be transformed and become ever more holy. So it cuts away the worldliness and it penetrates and this way is the Lord's chosen means to holify you, to sanctify you. The Lord Jesus said, your truth, your, the wor your word is truth. Now sanctify them by your word. And so that is the responsibility of every pastor to sanctify the people of God through the preaching of the word. And we're told by Paul to Timothy that all scripture is God breathed. And that's why the sword was coming out of the mouth of Jesus. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible is not only inerrant and infallible, there's no error and it's altogether true. It is also sufficient. There's a sufficiency. We don't need a third testimony as the Mormons try to tell us. The Bible, the closed canon of Scripture, six, six books, is sufficient that we would be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so this is how Christ feeds his sheep through the preaching of his appointed shepherds. Now I'm going to challenge you. What kind of an appetite do you have for this spiritual food, for the word of the Lord? If you have no appetite, it's because you're spiritually dead. A dead baby would have no appetite to eat. If a baby is feeding, it's a proof, it's alive. It's been nourished. It's got a hunger, it's got an appetite. It, it needs to grow, it wants to grow. If you have no appetite, it's because you are spiritually dead. But then maybe you have a little appetite. Just a tiny little appetite, just a few minutes here and there will do you. Well, then you are a lamb. You're a baby lamb. At least there's spiritual life there. We're thankful for that. Now, if you're spiritually dead, you must pray for salvation. That the Lord would breathe life into you and you would come to life. Then you'll be hungry for God's word. But if you have this tiny little appetite, then you're a little lamb. Precious to God, yes. But you must pray, Lord, give me a bigger appetite. Help my appetite to grow and then satisfy that hunger. Feed me from your word. Help me to delight in your words. Feed upon them. 
grow, mature. Ask the Lord to increase your appetite. But what about if someone decides, talking about a Christian, to cut off that channel of grace? Thinking, no, I don't really need that channel of God's grace. I don't need to be fed from the word through a preacher in a sermon. I can feed myself. I got a Bible. Stay at home. I can look at that. Yes, you can. But if you cut off that channel of God's grace, you are impoverishing yourself. You will continue in spiritual sickness. You will forfeit the joy and the peace and even the experience of the love of God, which he channels through his word when he assembles his people together. And you'll forfeit the assembly of God's people, the fellowship that we enjoy. Now, those who do have an appetite for God's word, those who can't wait to come, they're hungry, they want to hear what the Spirit has to say through his word. They want to have an encounter with God, with his people, through his word. Well, then you will not be disappointed. The Lord will honour that desire of yours. Even if the preaching isn't great, the Lord will still meet you through it, despite the preacher. There was Charles Haddon Spurgeon, known as the Prince of Preachers, at least from England, and he was saved through a terrible sermon. <laughs> he says himself, it was a really badly preached sermon. But the Lord used it nonetheless. <laughs> Save me. The Lord will still feed you through his word. And may you know something of this glorious presence and protection of God through it. Now there's a life application Bible commentary and, and this is what is written there in regards to this passage we're thinking of. Jesus, the Son of Man, he stands among the lampstands, and no matter what the churches face, Jesus is in control and protects them with his all-encompassing love and reassuring power. Through his Spirit, Jesus is still among the churches today. When a church faces persecution, it should, be, it should be remembered this deep love of Christ and his compassion. When a church is racked by internal strife and conflict, it should remember Christ's concern for purity and his intolerance of sin. Jesus is sovereign over the church. And so those of you that have an appetite for God's word, who enjoy being assembled by the Holy Spirit together to worship, you will be fed, you will be encouraged, you will be corrected and trained, and, and you will be prepared, sanctified, prepared as a bride for her groom, the church for Christ, to dwell with him forever. So we're being sanctified. We're being prepared. Jesus, even now, is among the lampstands. And Pastor Sandro and myself are the angels, the messengers in the right hand of Jesus that have been appointed to serve you. What a huge responsibility this is. It's a position of double honour, and it's a position of higher judgment, more severe judgment also. Jesus has chosen to shepherd you through the preaching of Pastor Sandro and myself. We are in his hand, his right hand, and he empowers us to do this. He's anointed us with his own grace to do this. And 
we would ask you to pray for us. Because we are your servants. We are to not lord over you, but we are to serve you in such a way that you will be better able to serve the Lord Jesus. So, please do pray for us. We need your prayers. Don't fight us. <laughs> pray for us. To the Hebrews, it says, obey your leaders. Submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us. We're sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honourably in every way. And so I speak on behalf of Pastor Sandra and myself. We have limited knowledge. We have limited understanding. We are work in progress. We're learning. We're being sanctified. You are. We are. But we can pray for each other. I got that mountain and I pray for every one of you by name. I even pray for the visitors I didn't know were going to come today. I've already prayed for you. And I spent quite some time doing that. Then I set about to have the last moments of preparation, of a week long preparation. I'm up there in the mountain and I'm preaching to Lily, <laughs> the dog, and to all the, the nature that's all around me. And then I come down ready uh, to feed the flock, to care for you, to tend to your greatest needs. And your greatest need is to know Christ more. That you might love him more. That you might serve him more faithfully. So, God is being glorified through Christ's church. Through you individually and through us corporately. He is. And the more that we speak Speak like Jesus. The more that we act like Jesus, the more that we love like Jesus, the brighter this lampstand will shine. Uh, and the more that God will be glorified through us. I'm going to pray. We thank you for your words, holy God. Please allow there to be fruit from them. Continue to sanctify us individually and corporately. Help us to have a greater and greater appetite for your word, which is a greater and greater appetite for Christ. To know your presence, your protection, to know you. To love you and serve you. And help us to express that love for you as we love each other. And to serve you as we serve each other. And so let us shine <laughs> that gospel glow. Let Jesus be seen in us. Let this lampstand shine brightly, we pray. And let each of us shine brightly with this love of Jesus. Now, Lord, we're going to break the bread and pass it among us. And we're going to drink of the cup too. And we're going to do this in remembrance of you, Jesus. We're going to do it with thanksgiving. We're not going to do it because we are worthy. We're going to do it because you are the worthy one. Because you did everything. You dealt with all of our sins on that cross. Past, present and future. They were all laid upon you. And you were made sin. And when God looked upon you, he hated what he saw. And he justly punished you for our sin. And it was paid for and he was satisfied as you were raised from the dead 
And we thank you for that. So we want to commemorate that time. Oh, please, even now, help us to prepare our hearts to do this. So important, Lord, that we do this. We need to do this. We get baptized as a Christian once. It's like a marriage ceremony. But then we must do this often, like an anniversary, to remember. Help us to remember you and what we are simply because of your grace shown to us. Help us to examine our hearts now before we share that bread and the wine. Amen. I'm going to allow just two minutes for you to do just that, to examine your hearts. Because no, I don't want anybody to eat or drink condemnation upon yourself, which is to take the body and it represents the body and the blood, but to take that without being conscious of Christ, without doing it as an act of worship and thankfulness. It's been called for centuries the Eucharist. The reason why is simply because that word means thanksgiving. It's an opportunity for us to give thanks. But we need to make sure that we are ready to receive the elements. And that bread will become a part of our bodies. That one bread, part of our bodies. And as there's one bread, there's one body here in Christ. I allow these two minutes and I'm going to play quietly in the background that blessed be the tie that binds because that reminds us of our brotherhood of love. So this bread is just water and flour. Mountain water and flour. And couldn't be simpler. And it is simply to remind us of our love for the Lord Jesus Christ in response to his love for us and also the love we have for each other. Because I love the Lord Jesus, I'm going to share this bread. And because I love you, I love each of you as your pastor and as your brother, I want to share this bread with you. So please hold on to it and we'll eat it together. So if you are a brother and a sister in Christ Jesus, if you love him with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, we love him imperfectly. But do you love him? Are you trusting in him alone for your salvation? Nothing you can add, nothing you can take. He's done it all. If so, well then we share this bread together in thanksgiving. And also we know our dear sister Annie is there in Romania. She too has bread and wine. Uh, and she's with us, um, sharing uh, this opportunity as well. And we look forward to you coming back in person. But even though the church meets in different places. For now, one day we will all meet together and we will never be parted. And we look forward to that day. And that was only made possible because of the, what, the, what Jesus did. His body was cut and bruised and brutally treated and hung on that cross. And blood escaped from literally the pores of his skin. But then from his head, his side, his back, his hands, his feet, where the beard had been plucked from his face too. And, and the pouring out of his blood had been done many times through animal sacrifices, but not all of the blood of all of the animal sacrifices could have atoned for one single sin. And yet Christ's once for all time sacrifice was sufficient for all of our sins, of all of God's people forever. And so his blood is poured out for the remission of sin, to have taken it from us and to have dealt with it and to have paid for it. And so please do drink of this cup also in thanksgiving.
Father, as we come and we see you seated on your throne, it is a wonder. It is a wonder to, to, to behold your glory, what you have done in giving your own Son that we might be free. And those who love the Son are free indeed. So Lord, we bring you our praise. You are walking amongst the lampstands. You are you care about your body, you care about your church, and we feel your love today, we feel your care, we feel your grace. We've known it in our lives. Oh, Father, we praise you now, and pray that you would take us to our individual workplaces, homes, with our friends, that we might shine Jesus, that we might be occupied with who he is and what he's done, and what he can do for this lost world. Oh, Father, help us not to be sorry and miserable and mean-spirited help us to love as he has loved us oh father give us that grace we ask in jesus name amen